Okay, so this is 30, so we should get started. Um, I made a few last minute changes to the agenda because I was out of town all last week and then we got together and realized there's stuff that wasn't on the agenda, so I apologize if you didn't see it. But here it is now. Um, we're starting with Jen Kamano from Friends of Pat giving us. <laughs> You were I, I know, I know. So, hi everyone, my name is Jennifer Camano. I'm the executive director for the Friends of Pima Animal Care Center. So we're the Friends group. Um, I was asked to come and chat with you guys today because sometimes there's new members, new volunteers. But I know a lot of these faces, so I don't think you're all new. So I'm open to questions, but essentially want to tell you a little bit about Friends of PAC is the official nonprofit philanthropic partner to PAC. What does that mean? So PAC covers certain things in their budget that are county mandates, and they go above and beyond that a little bit too, uh, because we expect life saving now from our municipal shelters. But all of that stuff really isn't a part of your taxpayer dollars, and so we do that through donations through the Friends of PAC. So what do we pay for? Um, we pay for Dr. Helena Waite and two full-time vet techs in the clinic for three years. We pay for Jeremiah, who runs playgroups, and Jamaica, who does um, pet support intervention to the people who come to surrender their pets. They're sort of face-to-face. -face. We also supply the fund that, um, that the phone pet support people use when they're providing assistance to community-owned pets, because our bylaws say we can only help pack pets. And of course, that's all that PAC can do too. But we see this as a diversion program. These would ultimately become our pets. So we have put money into diverting uh, intake. So we pay for um, minor, well, minor medical procedures up to $1,000. So that's not always so minor. Um, we pay for uh, um, boarding, uh, pet licenses for those who cannot do that, uh, boarding for people who are in a crisis. Um, Trying to think of what? Well, and I'm just thinking of the Keeping Families Together Fund. That's what we call That's the diversion fund. But in terms of here, we buy thousands of enrichment. So Nyla bones, peanut butter, chicken stock, um, collars and leashes so that every pet goes home with a collar and a leash if they need it, if the family needs it. Um, we pay for, it's so weird. I do this all day, every day. I pay V. Scott thousands of dollars for second chance surgeries. That's probably the biggest expense I have. That and salaries. So we've covered over the year 15 staff positions here at the clinic. Uh, probably eight vet techs. Oh, we pay for Lauren. Lauren! Lauren's one of our friends' hey, employees. Lauren. She's new. She's our critical care in uh, technician in, for cats. Surely for cats. So we try to supplement the things that really aren't covered in the PAC budget. And um, we've just recently started doing uh, training for our STR dogs. Um, I, I don't know what that's going to look like for us, but I think that's something that the friends should do off-site. So they have to be pack pets, um, which is part of our bylaws. So if a rescue pulls it, we, we're kind of like this and we can't. So we do some behavior through keeping families together for the community-owned pets. But what we're trying to do is um, work with some of our dogs who are, you know, they have they're sensitive and <laughs> they have bigger <laughs> issues. <laughs> so we send them out to, right now we're working with Soul Dogs. So um, those are some of my, uh, our larger expenses. Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting things. Printing materials, we did the donor wall and all the donor signage. Um, we send, we actually pay for staff development. So if there's professional development that either the vet, anyone really, it's up, it's usually, I work with Kristen very closely on, um, you know, here, this was sent to me, what do you think of this? Should we be doing this? Um, we pay for professional development for staff. We pay for, I give um, the volunteers, I give you guys your group for your um, whatever Gina and Bonnie feel they need to use it on, um, $3,000 a year. We write grants, so we're in the middle of several grants to um, extend boarding on pets and transport. We're trying to start a transport program. Um, so. Anyhow, this year we've probably given, by the end of the fiscal year, about $900,000 to PAC in direct services. Um, I have a feeling that will grow. Um, I'm hoping in this next year to buy agility equipment for dog yards that stays out there. So I have some links, and um, I, don't, I don't know how much we're going to spend on it, but like, I don't think it's that crazy expensive. I, mean, I think we can handle it. 
So with Chili Equipment, I know I'm looking at Lynn because she works with the stars a lot. And um, I can't remember everything. Do you guys have questions for me? Uh, so I work here in these offices. If you don't know who Friends of PAC is, you can look on our website. Um, you can make donations. You can just learn about us, watch, uh, look at the blog. We um, Central Pet runs the pet store, but we or they manage the pet oh. store and we sort of own it, if you will. Um, so it's our store. 50% of the proceeds come back to the animals here at PAC. Um, what else? Any questions? And you don't have to have a question. Do we need request for That's a great behaviors or So what I typically do is I work with, so on medical stuff, it has to go through Dr. Wilcox. This is not my wheelhouse. I don't understand half the time. Like, what is this? Like, what? So what is wrong with that? Dog? So, we, or um, yep. So it usually goes through. Um, when I answer requests, it's Kristen and Wilcox, or Kristen. And Kristen's on everything, and Tamsin and the behavior team. If it's like soul dog stuff, um, we have three focus groups right now, and they have a lot of discretion over how they spend their money. Mission Possible, which is just for the senior cats. Um, mature Munch, which are our senior dogs, and uh, Top Dogs, which are our sensitive and behaviorally challenged dogs. <laughs> so if we saw one of those dogs needed something, we would go to those people? Yeah, so like if you're in, I know you guys do grooming a lot, and you're like, you know, this dog has like, got this problem, or and it's medical. Um, I'm not sure, Bennett, you might be able to answer this, because I don't think they go directly to Wilcox. They might have to go to Gross, not Rosio. The medical is there someone Hazel Hazel who said that the boss lady back <laughs> <laughs> yeah thank you thank you. Yeah. Or Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yes I mean I take I take our requests generally run um, through Kristen Jennifer Wilcox Tamsin and her team on behavior um, Mostly, uh, those would be kind of the requests that come through volunteers. So, if anyone did, any then we could uh, go through the volunteer coordinator. Yes, they, you can. They would suggest going to these people. Yeah, if you have a question about it, I think you could just like write them and say, Hey, I'm a volunteer and I saw this dog and I think it's got this problem and this problem. And then he would follow up, or Gina or Bonnie, kind of depending on who you work with. Some of the focus groups, uh, Top Dogs works with Bonnie, Mature Mutts and Mission Plausible works with Gina. But you can always put a Bennett. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have to have it come through the behavior no, team and the medical team because, I mean, no offense to Jim, but she's not qualified to tell whether or not an animal needs a medical thing or a behavior thing. So letting the experts at the shelter be the ones to make the determination is the best way to use that money. And then we have a budget, and I, you know, I love to kind of see where we are in that budget, but um, we're doing all right right now. So I. Do you have different pots of money for different things? So like say if I wanted to donate, somebody wanted to donate, and they wanted it to go toward cats or or candles for cats or for whatever. So that's a really good question. We cannot restrict our funding down to an individual pet. That is really difficult for us. We have two people that were it's me and Sarah Wolfon and we have a part-time admin. Um, tracking the kind of expenditures per pet. Sometimes we'll get donations for a pet that we haven't even used yet. You know, like um, we're still waiting on little Angie who had the um, the paw. She needs a prosthetic paw, but she's healing, and so we don't really know how much that's going to be. But I've got a lot of people who want to help her. So we've created buckets like medical, behavior, which is not Tamsin behavior. It's sort of off-site behavior. The STR dogs. We have a mission. Um, Pausable, which is cats, and they have primarily chosen to right now cover total mouth extractions because stomatitis. We got a really great. Um, we're working with a vendor who, um, or a service provider, who gives it to us at a really good price. She's excellent, and so um, we've been trying to get as many cats teeth done so that they're more adoptable. Um, so we have a lot of buckets. Do you have the buckets for spay neuter? That we do not because that is a pet the, the KFT programs, the pet support program comes out of Friends of PAC. Under that we can pay for some spay neuter. Of community owned pets. Right. right. Um, but the spay neuters here are PAC budget 
and then there's a lot of community funding for other speakers. But the stuff that we're doing. And we and we don't do the community cats program either. It doesn't mean we couldn't, but right now that's in tax budget. That makes sense. So, but I see you around all the time. If y'all have any other questions for Jen, you can. And one question: When's your next fundraiser for Friends of Tech? Huh. <laughs> All the time, every single day. You have to raise money. How do you? We do. do. It? So we do it in a variety of ways. We write grants. We have good personal relationships with significant donors. Um, so we go to lunch. Um, <laughs> that's my fundraiser. Um, we are going to do a fundraiser. We want to do it on Leap Day next year, the 29th of February. We thought that'd be great, but now we're having trouble finding a place. Um, so we are going to do some sort of big fundraiser gala kind of thing. And actually, you know, the other fundraisers we do are we send out constant contact emails. So we had Arizona Gives Day. We raised $35,000 that day. Um, we did Giving Tuesday and raised $28,000. We do end of year. We send letters out to people who, hey, we haven't heard from you in a little while, you know, or thank you so much for your last gift. And, you know, so we have different ways that we do it, grants, special events, relationships with people, and also planned gifts. We do a lot with planned giving. So a lot of people have included us in their will. And I know it's funny, um, for fundraisers, we don't talk a lot about it, but those are the very best kinds of gifts because they are transformational. They're huge, usually. Are all the volunteers on your email list? Because I get good no. emails, so why not? Um, that's a really good question. You have to donate first, and then you'll and get on their email so list. So they you'll just say one out, you know? It was the it might be. Yeah. We, I don't know. The way we send, the way we send emails to all volunteers Enough. is through yeah. logistics, so Jen can't send it to like a distribution group. So if anybody wants Friends of Pack information, they just need to like show up and sign up for a newsletter. One thing we did do is we we did take people who have made donations to Pack with their licensing. They had an opt out option. We did transfer their data to us, so we mailed to them. So you can go to our website, friendsofpack.org, and a window pops up. You want more information, and you just type your email in there. So we'd love to be able to communicate with you, um, but some people don't like that. I certainly get 28 emails a day of like, I don't know how I got on that list. <laughs> so I just get to eat, 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 eat. So you know, sometimes you don't want that, but then you can come to our website and just check out what we're doing. We're also all over Facebook. Try to keep up the pace with everything. So. But if y'all have any other questions for Jen, um, Thank you. you can contact me or Bonnie or me. So you can contact one of us and we can pass it along to Jen or put you in touch or whatever. I also left a couple of our more recent newsletters up here, so grab one on the way up. Yeah. Thanks, you guys. Thank you, Jen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I got eggs for the other guys. <laughs> <laughs> Mitzi and Julius are here from Central Pet. They wanted to come and just talk to you guys about what Central Pet does and we'll just be available to answer any questions you have about them. So, so I think we recognize most of you guys before. Yeah. <laughs> we see you guys all the time, right? <laughs> see, yeah, you're clean, not us. We're still dirty. But. So for those of you guys who haven't gotten a chance to meet us, my name is Mitzi. Um, I manage partly for Central Pet, um, who's contracted by the county to care for pretty much everybody that's here. We care for everybody who is adoptable, who's isolated, for contagious illnesses, uh, the injured animals in the clinic. We pretty much care for everybody with the exception of Biter's Row or Gravy's Quarantine. Uh, so, <laughs> so rabies quarantine are the only animals that we don't care for here. Um, so really quick, like you said, uh, Mitzi, I, prior to this I was working for CPS and a little bit of customer service. Uh, this was my first animal job and now I live here. <laughs> my name is Julius, um, I've been working with animals for 10 years. Um, been with Central Pet for five. <laughs> been here at PAC for four years, so it's been a while. 
He's our most, he's the most tenured person out of all of us. He was, he was one of the first batch of board people to get here. So um, I think this is probably, aside from just getting a chance to meet you guys and talk to you guys and build our relationships out there and stuff, we haven't really ever gotten a chance to just kind of address what questions you guys have. And I know you guys are awesome about coming to us with the questions and concerns that you guys have. And we try to, to address everything as best as we can so that we can We'll be a happy family, but we've never gotten a chance to just actually go over what we do here and what our responsibilities are here. Because I know I think that's one of the biggest questions we often get is, is it your guys' job who does it? Do you guys do this or does PAC do this? Who's supposed to do this? So um, really quick, we're just going to go over um, what some of our staff's responsibilities are, what you guys see them doing, and what their duties are for a day to day. So um, it does vary between the morning shift and the night shift, but essentially our morning shift crew is really just here to deep clean as best as possible um, to make sure, I always call it the Disneyland effect, we want it to look incredibly clean and smell lovely, but there's nobody cleaning, so how does that happen? Um, so, uh, in the morning, our typical routine for our staff, I do definitely give them the wiggle room to kind of move routine around to make sure that it's, the goal is efficiency. Each person here in the morning cleans 60 kennels in about three hours. And that's in addition to feeding everybody, doing drinks, taking out the trash, detail work, and then dealing with whatever feedback we are throwing at them on top of that. So they've, they've got their hands full, but essentially what they do is they'll come in and they just kind of assess what's better for them, whether they prefer to start on the exterior, whether that's in pods or on the floor in the service side or something like that. So they'll start uh, by doing a general walkthrough, making sure that if there are sick animals, that they don't enter those kennels so that we're not spreading anything. Um, the probably between like seven and eight is where we get the uh, bulk of our poop pics um, of anybody who has diarrhea, anybody who's showing any symptoms of any kind of rep respiratory stuff or anything that even seems a little bit more serious or something like that. Um, so once they do their walkthrough, they make sure they secure the dog on the opposite side of their cleaning. Um, they go through their general routine of prepping the kennel, making sure that any fabrics, toys, anything like that is up high so that the dog's stuff doesn't get wet. Um, and then making sure that their food is switched out every day, their water is clean, and just really going to town on those kennels, <laughs> putting in the elbow grease for it. Um, and then basically once they're done with their 60 plus kennels, um, then they move on to feeding. Everybody receives the same training regarding um, what feeding they get. I know that's probably one of the most common questions I've been getting lately is who feeds the special diet dogs. Uh, we do. So we feed all of our special diet dogs. They're the only dogs who get fed, if nothing's changed. Um, they're the only dogs who get fed twice a day. We at Central Pet, though, we only do the morning feeding. Um, however, we feed everybody no matter their diet, uh, no matter their age. Our puppies receive a different um, kind of feeding schedule sort of thing. So uh, we do feed everybody once everybody is fed and they follow the protocol. I think one of the other really common questions we get about feeding is when it comes to separating dogs or dogs who are housed together. We as Central Pet, we do not feed anybody together. Um, and everybody is trained, that's a huge no-no. You don't give treats, you don't give toys, you don't do too much interaction with them together because we want to make sure that nobody's uh, wrestling in there. So, um, <laughs> everybody, so we do that, and occasionally with our bonded pairs, when we can kind of tell that they need each other for that stuff, then that's when they'll call Julius or myself, we'll come in um, and we'll try to safely see if they can eat together. If they do well, then we'll let them eat together. Um, and then once they're done with their feeding, everybody has a set of usually about four drains, uh, those trench drains that they clean. Um, and then from then it's just spot cleaning, making sure that everybody looks good, smells good, their windows are good, if they're supposed to have bedding, that they have that, if they could use some toys, if they have clean that. Water. Clean water, all of that stuff, we know it never stops. Um, and then during the night shift, it's really mainly just maintaining. Um, right now we're trying to work with PAC, which as we know, it gets super, super busy during this time and we have like no space. So right now our main focus is trying to coordinate to where we're getting the kennels that are empty for adopted dogs. Dogs are going out to foster and stuff like that. Making sure that those are being cleaned promptly um, so that they don't have to wait. And as soon as a dog is booked in, they can move out there and hopefully be reserved or their mom or dad will come get them or something. 
Um, so during the night shift though, their responsibilities are typically a lot bigger. So in the morning, each person is assigned about 60 pounds. Um, during the night shift, it's more like some people have 80 kennels and one person has 160. <laughs> so, uh, so when we do hear of like, and, and I mentioned that because I know a lot of times we'll hear like, you know, this guy hasn't gotten spot cleaned yet, and, and I, I say that because <laughs> there's a lot of them. And um, so during the night shift, their top three priorities are making sure everybody's spot cleaned, all the empty kennels are deep cleaned, and everybody's water is maintained so that when we leave at night, they have fresh water to drink throughout the night. Um, but then lastly, they make sure that everybody is secured on the inside. I know some of you guys leave later than we do. Um, they are required, though, to make sure everybody is locked inside in the morning. Er, at night, at 8 o'clock, and they're required to do a walkthrough and ensure everybody is inside when they leave. Um, so that, that way, we can say when we left, those guys were inside. So. Um, I think that's for the most part the general idea pretty much what we do is we're we're really mainly here to, to clean up after them. We we try to do a lot more than that. We try to provide as much feedback and help when it comes to their behaviors and and when we notice that somebody needs help, whether it's staff or volunteers or anybody, just in general provide all the help that we can and and we answer any questions. Yeah. You're probably in the kennels more than anybody else. When you see a dog that you know has had bad diarrhea or vomited, do you report it? Like we have a symptom mm -hmm. log. Yeah. So we, I have said that I feel like a poop expert. <laughs> um, I have really been, I, I, being here and seeing so much poop, um, and really getting to know the different factors of what causes what. Which of course I don't have medical training. These are all just the five hundred thousand questions I asked Dr. Wilcox. Um, so usually what we'll do is if they come in and they do have diarrhea, if they have been with us for just a few days and they're not displaying any other symptoms like uh, some sort of nasal discharge, vomiting, loss of appetite, lethargy, um, there's no blood in the feces, there's no mucus in the feces, then at that point uh, we give them a day to see if it stiffens up a little bit, see if it's maybe just the nerves, especially if they look anxious, if they look stressed out. Um, if it doesn't get any better the next day, then at that point I'll take it to the clinic. I usually, I always tell my staff, let me know the second you see it, because I, they know me in the clinic because I come in about a hundred times a day. <laughs> So I take it straight to them, and I'll take pictures, and we'll do one of two things. Either they'll tell me, um, can you go snap test them, and I will test them myself for Giardia or Parvo, so that we can get that answer right away, and they're not out there sitting in it or dealing with those symptoms and feeling uncomfortable for too long. Um, or two, if uh, they don't feel if that's a concern yet, then we will hang up a, a special diet sign, and we'll start them on special diet. Okay, vomit and vomit goes straight to the clinic. Yes, okay. if it, if they're vom if there's any secondary Sorry, symptom okay. whatsoever, okay. even if it's mild, straight to the clinic. Okay. No, I will go to the clinic, oh. um, and then occasionally they do, depending on what it is. Like we have had those dogs that vomit or like just huge amounts, or we'll see the dogs who just are so stressed out that they poop pure blood and we'll see the large amounts. Usually something like that where we can tell it's kind of like what we did. Yeah, I'll put him in a rolling kennel and I'll take the dog there. But for the most part, I just kind of take go to the clinic myself with pictures, feedback, the A number, everything like that, um, and just let them tell me what we need to do moving forward. On your first sighting of an incident, mm -hmm. where do you document it so you can track it? So if we come across something, is there a place or a, a computer area where you document it, where we can say, has this dog been documented? So we take it to the clinic. We are currently working with PAC to have chameleon access, um, but we take it to the clinic and we doc the clinic documents it. Um, it sounds wild, but for the most part, our staff is centralized in one area. Each individual person kind of has a routine where this person is usually a pod one, this person is here. So as crazy as it sounds, we usually know them. We, we know them to where we can remember ourselves. You know, Dakota has had diarrhea for three days, or Dakota has eight for two days, 
or you know, um, Ashton in Harry's Haven um, has been seeming a little off lately today, something like that. So we do make uh, mental notes and the clinic documents things. However, when we do see something that's progressively getting worse or something that seems like something we should keep an eye on, we have a whiteboard in our back section where we notate the dog's A number, the dog's name, and the kennel number. Thank you. Every single morning we have a huddle. Nobody starts their job until we have all met, and we will address it to the person who's working in that area. Hey, just so you know, you know, Pfeiffer on the floor has been seeming a little bit off today, but you keep an eye on her. So we as a volunteer can go look at that whiteboard to see if a particular um, dog you, is on it? You can, yeah, if you would like. You can also ask our staff. You can ask myself or Julius to see if you've also noticed that stuff. Because um, I think for the most part, it's it's just kind of maintaining. It, it's not, I wouldn't say it's a large volume that we keep on the board. It's really like one, two, three. Because for the most part, we get it dealt with right away. Um, either the clinic will say special diet, or they will say snap test, giardia test, whatever, um, and then we'll do that. So typically, we get an answer on what it is right then and there. The things that we monitor are more so behavior-wise, or things that are coming up. Like, I guess a good example for it is we had a dog for a while who was vomiting and had loose stools. Tested negative for parvo, tested negative for giardia, so we just put him on a special diet. But it was odd that it continued even after it was on medication. So that dog was on the whiteboard for a few days. But it's not typical because we'll try to address it that day with the clinic or or um, if we need to put a special diet. Yeah, if that makes sense. It does. If it goes further, we can always look at. Oh, the yeah, definitely. And we always clinic, take. But before it gets to that level. Just to know that you've noted it. Yeah, definitely. You can you can take a look at that whiteboard if you would like to. Um, it like I said, I, I wouldn't say if there's usually two. Like right now, we have one one on the board right now, um, but we usually get an answer pretty quick. So they they don't typically stay on the board for too long. I we usually as soon as I go look at the dog and I see what's going on, I make my way strip push whack it over to the clinic <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and then just make sure that we have a plan. Where is your office? Um, our office. <laughs> <laughs> Looking back there, because I don't have one. Um, <laughs> nice. But, um, just kidding. Um, so our little space is in the back of phase two where um, the food storage is, basically. Where the dish area is at. Yeah, like the dish area in phase two. Oh, okay. We have our little huddles back there. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Do you... Um, have extra people on weekends because I know that they open earlier. Yeah, so we don't, but we try to build a strong team on the weekends. So on the weekends, we we do do trainings on the weekends. We start our new people um, usually like Wednesday through Sunday, um, so they can feel the difference. They can feel the difference between a weekday and a night day, um, morning, whatever. <laughs> And but, the, the yeah. weekends we come in an hour early. Yeah. Uh, so we're here from 6 to 11 on the weekend. So we do come in a little bit earlier, but we try to make sure that we have our most efficient team on the weekend days. You do a good job. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate yes. it. Yes. Just to comment, you are running the place like the hospital runs. <laughs> <laughs> you try very hard. Huddle is their, their yeah. term, and they all have huddles. And um, they are lower on staff at night shift, so and I'm fairly new, and I just want to say I've, uh, I'm just, I think you guys are fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I really appreciate that. I really appreciate, honestly, any feedback. I think that was one of the things that I was telling Bennett and Danielle is that we definitely don't want anybody to feel like we don't want to hear even the bad if you guys notice something if you guys have suggestions about something like we're totally open to it we definitely don't want we're we're all a team here we're all working for the same goal it doesn't matter what level you're on we all want the same thing so we're here for anything you guys have mm -hmm. so you have a morning shift and an evening shift pretty much but we're here all day <laughs> so we have the, the mid shift and then yeah and the morning is the most people we yes. have Mm -hmm. okay. So, if dogs are cooking their kennel in between the shifts, somebody is going around. Yes. So, we're here from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. So, and, and that's straight through. The only difference between, I guess, throughout the day is that the morning we have, like you said, the biggest bulk of people. We have, I think, like 
12, just the 12 people in the morning. And during the night shift, I think it's like six of us. Um, so him and myself are always here during the night shift um, to make sure if anybody has any questions. It's either him or myself, but um, one of us are always here for feedback, for issues, for anything that they need, and then just trying to kind of keep things moving. Um, but that's really the only difference, is that in the morning it's a whole bunch of people, and then at night it's a strong <laughs> <laughs> Yes. I, I've asked several times for help from the group. And they've always been wonderful. Yeah. Uh, but I hope you all feel like uh, you could ask any one of us to help. Yeah. We do. I, we we built yeah. it's with. I guess I recognize a lot of you guys. <laughs> we, we we all we all live here together. We're all roomies. Yeah. So <laughs> we we want you guys to feel like that. Just a fast question. One o'clock in the afternoon on a Saturday. Um, uh, having a kennel with the new dog just came in yesterday and uh, has diarrhea all over. Uh, where would I find a central pet at one o'clock Saturday afternoon? So that's because we're never in the same place. Well, so, I'm willing to run around and find. Yeah, you. which is honestly, it sucks, but that's what I would say. Um, you can check back in the that back section of phase two. Um, him or myself usually take after like twelve, twelve thirty to do. All the extra stuff like payroll and scheduling and following up with people and doing orientations and all the other stuff. Um, so we're usually back there. That's the time that we take for that stuff. So you can check back there to see if we're back there. Um, if we're not, though, one of our people is walking around it at, 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 in all general areas, like on the floor in phase two. We have one person maintaining that entire area. In pods, we have one person maintaining all three of those. Um, in cats, we have one person maintaining their isolation, same thing, clinic, same thing. So we're kind of everywhere. It's just trying to track us down. So that could be at the other end when you're at the other yeah, end. Yeah, that's it. We have that problem. We'll be looking for one of our staff, and they walk well, out the certain. door. And leave. <laughs> yeah. I know you're totally different from the store. But do you know the definitive answer for what percentage of the proceeds in the store are given back? I heard 50%. 50%. And yeah. that is 50. 50, yes. Because I've heard other, and I didn't. 50% is what I've always heard. Mm -hmm. uh, we are separate, but i that's what I've always heard is 50%. Okay, thank you. Anybody else have can you talk a little bit about those cards that you put on the kennel? They say, um, please don't take my toys. It yes. makes me grumpy. So, <laughs> so we, we have a few different signs that we try to kind of maintain. Um, so we put up and down all of the uh, special diet signs. Those signs specifically are for the resource gardeners. Um, so those are, if you see those signs on any kennel, that's somebody that either uh, behavior has already told us that they do have known issues, uh, resource guarding, whether it's with food, toys, whatever it is. Um, but we also put those up meanwhile. So if we have a new dog and my staff comes to me and tells me like, you know, this dog just charged me and did this, or he's acting really funny, or he, you know, they describe something that seems resource guardy. Um, him or myself will go kind of take a look at the dog, see if we can see those same behaviors. If we see something that seems concerning <coughs> for our staff and for you guys, uh, we'll put that sign up. And then I will send an email to Tamsin and describe the things that we saw with the A number and everything like that so that from that point that dog is on their radar and they can do their evaluations. And then from there, either one, they'll leave the note or the card um, to letting everybody know that they're resource guarders. Uh, or do take it down and let us know what the behavior was, how we can handle it, how we can better manage that dog. And do you always put them on front and back? So front and back, and yes. That right was there. a problem for a little bit, but we got that figured out. So yes, we will make sure they are both front and back so that you can see them on either side wherever you go for them. Okay, thank you. With the signs, we try to make them adoption friendly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's <laughs> why they keep yeah. it. Yeah. It, it doesn't look good to just be like, I. Resource. Yeah. <laughs> like, the, don't put your finger in the mic. It's a jelly. Yeah, and I'm asking, you know, okay, how grumpy are you going to get? Yeah. 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 And for those dogs, I mean, personally, from the ones that we've encountered that are resource guarders that have those, it really just, it, it's really just kind of pulling them out of the kennel. Like, I, with my staff, if, and, and very few of them, um, we do a lot of training regarding, like, animal handling and breeding the dogs and 
picking up their behaviors and things like that. But if for whatever reason we have to move the dog or they have to move the dog, they are all instructed do not go into the kennel. Um, we leash from the outside and move from the outside um, just to kind of minimize the possibility of anything like that. And that's, that's kind of what we've noticed is the research starters. We won't look at your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if y'all have any other questions from it to you, Julius, you can email one of us and we'll pass it along. But. Well, thank you guys so much. <laughs>
that basically says, thank you for filing this report, here's how you send us a picture, and here's a list of other places to double check um, and see you know, if you can file a report. The like Humane Society, Paul Boost, Craigslist, she was first to start. Just curious, any insight as to why there are no lost and found up in the Northeast area? Up here? Well, yeah, in like, you know, foothills area? Um, it's been my experience that typically either they find them right away if they lose them, or they just don't go missing as often. I mean, this is the same thing with your hot spots, right? So more people that live in these areas have issues with fencing, have issues with you know containment, have that kind of thing. So you're going to see a higher population of stray animals in those areas. So <coughs> we do get to see animals. Maybe the, the emus were up here. They were lost, or they were They were lost. Actually, they escaped from the ladies. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She's really upset. So see the emus. Generally speaking, out of those yeah. found yeah. animals. Many of those end up in the shelter? Like, do 50% end up in the shelter? I would say probably a higher percentage. I don't know the exact percentage. Um, but not all of these are just found reports. A lot of these are stray animals in shelter. So, and there are more animals that are listed as strays on our list right now. This just only goes back 10 days. So anything that was here um, before 10 days ago does not come up on this map. Okay, but I can show you. This is a, a report that I get every day for these posters, and this tells you how many animals um, that are listed as strays um, that have been here longer than 10 days. So basically we have eight cats and 82 dogs as of an hour ago. Um, and if I scroll down, you see all these numbers here? This tells you exactly how many days they did. So if I go back, See, Odin, been here 112 days. Pony Dash been here 106 days. So, yeah. so we have some that are here. This is this is one of my main issues right now, trying to figure out why people aren't coming here or calling, and trying to alleviate that. Obviously, I'm not going to be able to fix everything if they just are fed up or whatever, and the dogs escape the six. And the reason why you're uh, wondering is because these animals act like they. Been because they would have, it's unlikely that they would not have had an owner at some point. Okay. I mean, I, 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 these, these ones here, these ones have chips where I've had contact with the owners. Uh -huh. The reason it's listed as NFA is because I've either had contact with them and they've said no, or I've hit a dead end and I'm not able to contact anybody. Else. Yes. Out of those, do you ever um, check if they actually came in at some point and adopted another animal? If I if I know who they belong to, these ones we don't know who they belong to. That's the point we're trying so to figure out. So you contacted the owner. And then yes, yes, we do we do check on that sometimes. And if only for you know if we have extra information, I check addresses to see if there's other people at the addresses. I check their phone numbers to see if there's more people listed at that phone number. You know we do. There's a lot of like detailed stuff that we try to get into to at least try and make contact. Does licensing see the people who have lost pets that are adopting a pet today? I can't answer that. I don't know. I don't know. Danielle, do you know the answer to that? I'm sorry. I whether, or not, whether or not licensing checks for people who've actually lost a pet before they send out, before they adopt? What if they have a pet that's missing and they're in the shelter today adopting? There's no cross-reference for licensing to see that? But they never could find the person. I mean, it's probably under the person's name, yes, but we're not going to ask them if it's missing, no. So I mean, had, like, if I looked you up in the computers, I mean, all of the animals you've ever had or right. you've ever brought in, I can see. Yes. But I'm not going to ask you, are do you still you have all of these are animals? Or are you but Scrappy the lists the ones that she knows, and the owners don't want them. I right. guess well, the answer to the question is it would not it be that, that I don't have That's any other It won't. No. Right. Yeah, yeah, these, these may not be that they just said I don't want it. They could be, I don't have any of, like, the address is bad, like we've sent letters and they come back, phone number's bad, you know, right. any, that just may be all that is. Like, I don't have any other information to go on. 
for that. So, like, and that's just my no forwarding address. Is that in that no further action. No further action. In other words, I, there's nothing I can do with that. Yeah. Yes. If I'm working at the greeting desk and somebody comes in and says, I'm looking for my lost dog. Yes. Right? How long has it been lost? About three days. Okay. Can I on chameleon sit right there and come up with a list of all the strays that came in and say, sure. tell me something about your dog and yeah. look down here and say, yeah. go to D17. I'm happy to give anybody training on that if you want to yeah, do a search. Yeah, you yeah. can, you can check the website. The website has all of the stray pets yeah. posted as well. Yeah. All the intake pets. Um, it even ha it has... The, if you check Pet Harbor, it's got all of the reports that we take overall. So. All right, so but if I went to Pet Harbor, it's going to give me a list of everything that's a stray. If, yeah, you, there's an option to you know search for zip codes and that sort of thing, and, and like basic dog or cat, that sort of stuff. In you, Pet Harbor you search or chameleon, in, there is a special search box on the bottom okay. that you know basically when you're doing those searches, I call it like treating it like an onion. So you start really big, and then you get really small towards the middle. So start like just dog. I wouldn't even put male or female because you never know if it's listed in the day basis being spayed or neutered. So up there experiment. Yeah, and I can I can give anybody yeah. training on that. You should you also to. always send them over to the admissions lobby because yes. they always file a loss yes. report for them if they don't have a current one. Mm -hmm. And by current, after seven days it drops out of our system. So if their animal's still missing and they're still looking for it, then they should come back over so that we can make the report again so that People still I typically recommend oh, so that people come to the shelter after a period of time. Okay. and look at least every other day because we're only required to hold strays that don't have tags and stuff for three days. So if you're coming every other day, you're almost guaranteed to catch it if you come like on that middle day or the last day. That's good advice. Yes. Thank you. So um, like she said, the reports drop off after seven days. They can either call the lost and found line and say, hey, can you update my report? Or they can send an email. They should have already gotten that automatic email, so they can just reply to that. And Josh is working on something right now for everybody who's filed lost and found reports to get another email stating, hey, do you want to update your report after seven days? Yeah, no one ever told us seven days it expires. A lot of people don't update us, so we have to have it drop off. Otherwise, we do Right, it. otherwise you'd have to date us yeah. everything, forever. So sorry, Marcy had her hand up forever. Go <laughs> ahead. So I'm just wondering if there's a plan to um, help. Well, on the website, you can see the strays on the map, and you could see lost reports, a link to the list of lost reports. There's um, no place to see a list of the found reports. And so if someone has lost their pet, and they come here looking for their pet, there's no place they can go to see the dozens of animals that have been reported found and are in somebody's They, they do, because they get treated the same way as strays that get signed into the shelter. So everybody gets a picture. It's all basically the report is listed as home, and that's no, the only distinction. No, if I'm looking for my lost pet, I can't find it on the website. It doesn't have found reports. It does. It and does. Yes, the what Pet Harbor does. No, I'm no, just, our website does as well. If you look on the website, there's a distinction between it'll be listed at home or it'll be listed as stray. If it's listed at home, it means that somebody found the pet, filed the report, and has it at home. So you can see all that stuff on the website just the same as you would any other Cats straight pet. Dogs. Cats and dogs, yes. And emus or <laughs> For sure, because I just had a lady the other day I just tried to find it. who thought a dog was hers, and she came in, and she's like, this dog is here, where is it? And I said, it's not here. It's actually with the finder. Right. Right. And you're looking on the, you're looking on the wrong site. Actually, no, that's wrong. It was her report that she had filed. Right. She's like, this is I my that, dog. I get that all the and time. I said, you're looking on the wrong site. You're looking at found or lost pets. You need to look at found pets because she was seeing her own oh, report. Oh, and so she thought she had found I her get that all the time. People uh, look at the wrong So they are both there. there. You just have to make sure you click on the right link. Well, there's lost and there's found. And under the found, I thought uh, all I could find was the ones in the shelters. No, they should show up. They okay. all should show up. There may not be a ton of them that are listed currently. But the list every day, so I know who's on the found list. If it's not, so I get separately. If, you're, if your report, yeah. your report may not include things that are listed as found. You may ask Josh if, if that doesn't include things that are at home. Not, well, I get a report of just the homes, a separate email. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't know what to tell okay. you. I, I know I'll for sure up. that they get listed. I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad sure. I'm wrong. Yeah. I'll follow up if I have a problem finding it. Wait, she was next. Sorry. I was just going to comment that when you click on the link in our website for found pets, mm -hmm. it goes back quite some period of time. So it's not ten days. It's that's for sure. 
No, so, I'm but it, it takes you to Pet Harbor. Pet Harbor. Right. It has almost you know, as many animals as going to Pet Harbor to look at see who's, you know. Right, but we don't, we don't control Pet Harbor. Right. Right? No, so understand. what Pet Harbor does, however long they have, that's mm -hmm. not something that we do. But our reports, just for the lost reports and for strays at home, drop off after after seven days. Right. Right. So if you can't search it on, I mean, if you had a specific ID number, you could search it, but they just you're not going to find it just in the regular search. So. Do you pick up anything that turns up on nextdoor.com? There's a lot of pets that lost I don't and yet. found. I don't yet, but they're working on giving me access to the to the pack um, next door so that I have access to that. But they haven't. I, like I've only been doing this two months. Lot of I probably do so much. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we're working on it for sure because that's that's definitely a good one. And Paw Boost is another good Paw one as well. Is good. Yeah, and that's on the list that they get for the emails that say this is how many. This is where you should check. Joe, I just I can't remember what you said. The lost reports drop off after how many days? Seven. Seven. Yes. Okay, thank you. Unless they renew them. Okay. In which case we'll add more time. Anything else? All right. So if you want to sign up. To help pass out posters, send me an email. I have 12 people right now. I, I, last week was the first week I did it. Um, I think the passing out part went pretty well. I guess we'll see if anybody responds to, hey, I found my pet. Yes, ma'am. Where, uh, whereabouts are you posting those, the, the posters? Like they in, they in should the be areas? posted in, in the area where they Damn. came from. Okay. okay, thank you. So I had, like I said, I pull from this list every day, and I pull, you know, five or ten, and I send that email out, I'm doing the email once a week right now, and I say, hey, is anybody in this area who can post these posters oh, sure. in that area? Okay. So, yes, Joe? What are those numbers, 78, 80, 82, 83, what are those That's numbers? the days they've been in shelter. Oh, okay, thank you. So this is why I pull this report, because it's anything that's been in shelter over 10 days, um, and I want to know why these animals are staying here so long, okay. right? So part of my, part of the thing is like, why, why didn't Odin's person come, or why didn't, Whoever, he probably wasn't Pawnee Depp when he came in here, but why has he been here for 106 days? Yes, ma'am. Um, I also have these cool yard yes, posters yard that I failed to bring in here. <laughs> um, but they're like neon green, um, and so they say like lost dog, lost cat. Um, I think No Kill Puma County had them made with TEP at one point. So if you don't want them back, um, if anybody wants to take one and put them in their yard um, and just yeah, so have you, them there. If you wanted to sign up for the poster you thing, you can just rotate if you have one in a specific area. I can just send you posters and you can just rotate them out. Um, I don't know how pretty they are. Is they're weatherproof? Yeah, they're pretty good. Are they? Yeah, okay. they're nice. Okay. I, know, I can give you one after the meeting or you can come by and see me or Bonnie. If you take one, though, just let me know if you have one so that I can make sure I add you to the list so I'm not forgetting oh, one. Yeah. So, I just had a thought. Yes, ma'am. We've obviously, after the dogs are over their stray weight, we name them. Yes. That if you are to print a flyer with on one of those dogs and it shows that name, it yes, doesn't. It doesn't. Yes. Cool. So the, so the strays it. that I send out for the long term strays don't have a name on them Perfect. for that reason. Thank you. So. And some of y'all may have seen the asterisks behind some names. Yes. That means we changed it. We came up with it in shelter, but they came in as a stray, but still on stray. We were having a little confusion with, like, people were like, hey, that's my dog. Its name is not whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's only been here a couple of days. So then I'm like, we need to fix that so that I'm not confused. And it was all because I'm confused. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so the book is... Sure, go ahead. Uh, the posters, when Bennett was doing it. I I did some posters oh. in my neighborhood. You okay. know, she, or, or, it was, it, anyway, I put up some uh, posters just like on telephone poles. And okay. So this, I've been specifically told that we are not allowed to put things on telephone poles or anything owned by the city or the county. Um, I attempted to apply for a special license to get that to allow us to be the only people allowed to do that specifically, and yes, I know the public still does it. They're not allowed to either, um, but they, they denied my license. So, as of now, what, all we're allowed to do is like public places, community boards, vets offices, grocery stores, fast food places, any place that the public might come in to see it. So. And did we have any success with the posters? I honestly didn't get to follow up, which is one great thing about 
Scrappy being in this position, she gets to follow up on all of it. Hopefully, I'm crossing my fingers. It's been a week since we passed out like a dozen of them last week, and I haven't heard any word yet, but I'm crossing my fingers. And you know, and there's going to be those times too where they get adopted yeah. and they go away because they've been here so long and they need to get adopted and go away. But you know, even if these things don't return their people, you know, the animals to their people, what it's doing is putting it out there that you really should call pack for your pets, right? right? right. Yeah. I, I can't tell you how often somebody's like, so I went missing two weeks ago, I didn't think to call you, I tried all these other things, but, yeah. you know, it's, it's surprising to me how yeah. little people understand that they should be calling us, so, yes, John. Who, who said we couldn't do it, the city or the county? Both. <laughs> it's, it, there's a, there's a um, Tucson City Ordinance states that you're not allowed to put things of certain kinds on their poles and their stuff. It might interfere with their property. I mean, it's not like we're advertising a concert for crying out loud. We're Correct. trying to You're reunite these 17,000 dogs with their owners. Yeah. I, yeah. I am not in disagreement. <laughs> I'm not in disagreement with you. And I, we have to keep trying. But they say no because they don't want us with, um, you know, putting stuff on their property. And and they'll so they'll call that number. They they'll will. call PAC. And, and yes, and our logo is all over right. these. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't want this program to go away. Right. So if you know if they start calling us and saying, "Hey, your people are putting these on the poles," and it's got to stop, I don't like. I don't want the our street signs, right? Street names. Yes. Yeah. Anything that's owned by the county right. or the city. And if y'all think that's something that should change, contacting your representatives and telling mm -hmm. them you wish we could do that is important. Yes. Yeah, my favorite yes. place was the bus stops. That's yes. oh. yeah. Again, you know, know, the city it, used to charge private citizens for posting their stuff. Yeah, you can, yeah. And again, you can apply for licenses now, but I think the reason they turned me down is because they were afraid there was going to be so many of them. Like, <laughs> well, they're right. <laughs> I, I, I suspect. They didn't give me a specific reason. They just listed their work and so I'll work on it, though. We'll, we'll see. Oh, we, you never know. We might get some other really amazing thing, and we can look it out the polls. And, Okay. We'll get a big billboard. <coughs> hey, on all if you're streets. willing to pay for it, I am more than happy to help you with that. For sure. Anybody else? No questions? No. If you need anything, please feel free to email me. I live in the adoptions office now, so um, I'm where the TNR girl used to be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. valuable in the clinic, so it's exciting to have her there and be able to handle these dogs that aren't always happy to be in the clinic. Um, Josue in the clinic resigned, and his last day was last week. Um, but Dr. Winters is here. She's been here since the 8th, uh, and she's doing great. Dr. Wilcox said she hit the ground running and was like right on it. So very excited about having her here. We have three right now. Um, we will hopefully be getting a fourth, but we, there's nothing official yet. June! Um, it is? Okay, so June, we'll be hopefully getting a fourth. So yay for that. Um, and I know all the vets are very excited about it. Dr. Wilcox in particular is getting to be more involved with outreach again now that she has you know, the, the wiggle room. Um, Caitlin, who used to be in licensing, moved to Pet Support Center. Um, so she's over here now. Uh, they're very excited to have her there. Um, and we had interviews for 10 tent positions. Uh, those are going to be kind of filling in some of the gaps and being available for when staff's not here, just helping get us some more hands. Um, hopefully we'll be getting those guys started soon, and we're very excited about those. Um, we're very excited about everything this week. So. <laughs> uh, the visual org chart, that is still happening. That's 
on me. I've had other priorities, but I haven't done it. So if I haven't done it a week from now, you can yell at me um, because I should be getting after you by then. So give me give me a couple more days and yell at me if I don't have it by next week. Um, the volunteer report from all the surveys and the feedback sessions we had, it is written. It is going through its last edits and you know we're finishing it up. So that should be getting sent out soon. We're hoping it's going to be done by Thursday. Um, we are designing signage to go in the front of the kennels for long stay dogs to kind of draw people's eye to them. So when we're designing stuff, we have to, you know, kind of loop comms into some of it, and it's a bit of a complicated process to get something up that we are allowed to have up. Um, but those should be coming soon, and we're actually, we had 115 dogs a couple weeks ago that had been here more than 30 days, and today we're down to 80. So it's, that's awesome. Um, we're also down to 365 available dogs, which is great because we were over 400 there for a minute. Um, and it's good that it's going down, you know, heading into summer. Uh, the last big thing is I think we're going to, the last big thing that I think is big, um, we are looking at buying some specific, like, canned food. So I know for the cats, they don't always like the one option we have, so we're going to come up with, like, three options and have a bunch of that. Um, we're also going to be buying some chunky food for the dogs because we know that there's an issue with the dogs like pushing down their food and then it being too dense for them to actually get to it. So we're going to be buying some chunky food for the dogs um, and more canned food for the dogs. That's still, it's still like a special diet, so we have to let CP and the clinic decide who's getting what, but we're going to have it available, so it is there for the dogs. Um, do you have any questions about any of that? Yes. No, uh, they can be replaced. I don't know yet. Um, I haven't been part of those conversations, so I don't know. I think it's important for the staff to be fully staffed. Yeah, we'll let you guys know as we as I find out. The food is diamond. I think so. Yeah. And um, Spain neuters are just Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or you don't know. Danielle, do you know when what I'm day sorry, spay neuters are? I failed to hear that question. It's okay. Sorry, it's me. I keep distracting. Do you know what day spay neuters happen? Um, so it's not set days right now because we have a contracted vet come in some days. Um, so it's very it's sporadic. So I can't answer that question because some weeks it's Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and some weeks it's Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. So, but it's at least three times a week. Okay, thank you. Once all our vets are up to snuff, it will be Monday through Friday. More consistent. Yeah. So we have an answer. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Is there a current uh, PAC communication chart with email addresses? I found this in my folder that I carry around, and there's a lot of people on here that aren't here anymore. And so I said to myself, well, this is old. Um, so, <laughs> so, so is there something like this that has, you know, the various, yeah. like, supervisors and people? It, it just, it's just, it's a very uh, comprehensive right. people who are in charge of all the different aspects and, and an email address. So I can, like, pick this out and just send an email to somebody. Mm -hmm. We don't have a list of who, like, of the email addresses. And the visual word trick doesn't have space for them, but everybody's email is first name dot last name. So, with the org chart, you with the visual or team chart, you, you can find out their email by first name. Dot but last this was to con to know who to contact. Who to contact for various things. Okay, you know. It's something I made a while back. And is that where I got it? Yeah, it was for volunteers uh, before our new volunteer manual, um, which does have some contacts, but. <laughs> Yeah. Well, here's a question. Can we get a, a new one made? If I showed you this, could you yeah, see yeah. what you could do about, you know, you'll see what I'm what I'm looking at here and yeah. maybe be able to figure a new one? Yeah. And cool. Sheena has it. It should be okay. Change. Thank you. Do you have any other questions for me? Okay. It's Bonnie's turn. Well, it's after 6.30, so I, you can skip me, right? <laughs> no. I'll help with something. Okay. Oh, still talking about like, she won't go home. like me not having something to say. <laughs> I always talk. Come on, it's fun. <laughs> All right. Hi, guys. Hi. Oh.
Okay, so first, I have a really, really huge, for all the dog people in this room, I really need you to come out and help us on Friday morning. Um, we have a big group that comes out. This will be their third year, Second Chance. Um, they're a group of amazing folks. Uh, Second Chance is actually the kind of umbrella organization, and they have a lot of different groups um, within that that come out. And these are folks that have been previously incarcerated, and they are coming back into becoming functioning members of society again. And these different organizations that come out with Second Chance um, are helping to facilitate that. And so these folks have come out now for the last, like I said, the last two years. This will be the year three. And um, they're really fantastic. They're super energetic and really excited to come out and spend time with the dogs that morning. Um, right now, we need about 30 to 40 runner, dog runners that morning. Um, they're going to be bringing anywhere between 80 to 150 people. We won't know until they get here that morning. Um, I have 10 people signed up right now. I've been sending out pleas, we've been talking about it for the last few meetings. Um, I'm seriously desperate. We need help. Um, show up, you don't have to bring your leash, we have everything you need that morning. Um, I just really need help. Gina's also, uh, because we don't think we're going to have anywhere near enough runners that morning, Gina's also going to be doing some stuff in here with some of the folks to help offset um, not having enough people to help run the walk. So um, even for some of you cat folks, you're more than welcome to come out that morning and give Gina a hand in here um, to help keep things move, uh, moving smoothly in here with the folks that are not actually going to be doing the walk. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. What dog are you um, As far as running dogs, even if you have only completed your dog um, training class and your mentoring class, that's fine. Um, as long as you have a green dot, you're more than welcome to come out. We pull green dots and lower level blue dots for these walks. We don't take any out uh, of our known behavioral issue um, blue dots and no oranges ever. Um, so they should be relatively, well, you all know how that works. <laughs> they should be relatively <laughs> easy to handle, but, you know, they are cat dogs after all. Um, so seriously, it's on logistics under Second Chance Walk, uh, Second Chance Group Walk, I think it is, or Second Chance Group Dog Walk, I don't know, Second Chance, okay? Um, yes? How many of those uh, dogs are available to walk Friday morning? Oh, I honestly have no idea. Um, Tamsin will actually be giving me a list on Thursday afternoon so that um, I can make the tags up. Um, I'm more worried about how many runners I have than I am about how many dogs to walk. We've got plenty of dogs. That won't be a problem. So will you have like different areas, different tables set up, or, or are you going to have it all in one area where the runners or are the running from? We'll be pulling dogs. Uh, because of the size of group it is, even with only 10 people, we've even, I've never had to do this in five years of doing these dog walks. This is the first time I have ever had to ask staff for help um, to help run dogs that morning. So we're hoping that maybe we can get some staff members that might be able to come out and give us a hand for a little while. Um, basically, we need help from 7.30 to 9.30. Um, the last of the dogs, we won't, we won't send anybody out after 9.30 that morning so that everybody can be back inside um, and be done by 10. So um, we'll have two tables set up. Basically all the information, um, I'll send out a thing on Thursday for everyone who signed up to participate on Friday um, so that we'll meet in that breezeway area between licensing lobby and phase two. So I go over all of what everybody needs to know. And there's a few other jobs there as well. Um, I currently have one person, um, Sherry's the only person I have signed up to help with traffic flow, which is a really big deal. Um, the mornings of these walks because we need multiple people out at the park. So you could even do that. That doesn't have, that doesn't involve um, dog handling at all. It's really just to help keep making sure that everyone is keeping a long distance, you know, 15 feet or more between dogs, etc., um, so that we don't get backed up as dogs start coming back in and that sort of thing. So again, I go over all of the different jobs that morning with the folks that are there for the walk. So um, yeah, if you can sign up, anybody listening out there and. Facebook land, um, yeah, it would be really awesome if we could have uh, a whole lot more runners that morning and make our lives a little bit easier. Um, I also wanted to appeal to our cat folks here, um, those of you that are here or that may communicate this to some of our other cat folks, we are in desperate need of more cat mentors. Um, we have this month and next month roughly about 100 to 120 new people um, joining the ranks of volunteers. A lot of those people are interested in working with cats. Um, we've got the cat classes. I can't get them mentored. Um, we currently, right now, we have one that's on a temporary uh, leave for family medical issues. Um, another one who's having car issues. I have three, 
three, four mentors right now um, for approximately 40 new people coming through classes this month. So do the math on that. That's almost impossible. Um, so our next mentor class, and I always need more dog mentors as well, um, but our next mentor class is on Sunday the 28th, so this coming Sunday um, from 2 to 3.30 in the volunteer room. If you're interested, please, please, please sign up. Um, I'm happy to walk you guys through the mentoring programs um, for the different areas. I'm Ms. Jim Seltzer with the Honorable Honda PRB. You left your dog in the car, please come immediately and take your dog out of the car. Again, Honda PRB with a wonderful warranty. Um, please take your dog out of the car at this time. Thank you. I'm going to go break his window off right there. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm going to kind of think, what else do we have? I just sent out an email about help for play group and enrichment um, behavior team. So Megan is in that department, and there was an injury for another person, so they are down. Um, to work in the yard, that's what they need most. You have to have gone through play group training and have an orange dot. If you would like to run your own play groups at some point, that's the way to do it. Um, once the behavior team sees that you know what you're doing and they're not going to like instigate dog fights, then that's what you <laughs> run your groups. Clearly I'm all, they won't let me run play groups. To run dogs, you just have to have a green dot because we'll only have you deal with the green dot dogs. Um, and enrichment, you shadow the behavior team and we'll show you what to do. So we did loosen the requirements a little bit since we need to get people in right now. Um, but since y'all are all like established volunteers, then I'm so glad that I explained all of that to you. <laughs> um, here's the thing. I don't know that uh, if everyone got the original agenda that I sent out last week, well, then it was gone, but we were expecting to have someone here this week with us um, doing trainings. And so we found out very late when Friday, I think. So it really kind of threw everything. And we've been scrambling to figure out what we could do to fill all of this. So that's why you got to see some of the other folks here tonight that we did um, who weren't necessarily going to be here originally. So. I didn't have a whole lot prepared because I literally had five minutes to talk to all of you, which I've already done. Um, we're about to so Yeah. All right. We're good? Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I know. <laughs> Gina. What do you uh, think you're going to get out of this? I don't just have to be honest. You're upset. Uh, for anyone that doesn't know me, I'm Gina. Um, I just was going to make a few announcements, really. But um, for April, we had our volunteer party. Yay! Yay! Yay. Um, Yay. I hope everybody had fun. Um, we did Adopt Love, Adopt Local. And thanks to everyone that helped out with that. We adopted out 25 dogs that day, so that was awesome. Um, we've been doing our Sunday family fur days, the second and fourth Sundays here for families that come in and we did an Easter themed event and we had the kids look for Easter eggs and make Easter baskets and we had some therapy dogs that came in and helped the kids look for Easter baskets versus some of our shelter dogs, but hopefully next year we can kind of change that around. Um, but it was pretty successful and fun. Um, we've been to lots of schools this month. Um, we did a big Earth Day event at the Children's Museum. Um, and I'm currently working closely with Ampire Junior High with some really great kids. Really great kids. Who I will great. win over. <laughs> um, uh, so it's clearly it's it, it, it's clear to me that it, yeah. I'm glad that we're there because they really do they need, um, need to learn some things. <laughs> so um, upcoming events, we got Tap and Bottle Adoption Event, um, Tap and Bottle North, um, Brewery, <laughs> on the 27th from, I think it's 1 to 5 or 2 to 5, so um, I think that event is full, but if you guys want to go hang out and support, have fun there. Um, there's also a Mature Mutts meeting, so for those that want to learn more about becoming part of Mature Mutts, um, that is this Saturday as well at 11. Um, I believe in this room. 
and um, it's just to get people involved. And now the Mature Mutts has these cool little shirts that they made. Um, so if you guys want to buy one, I think they're selling them for $20. Um, more shirts for everybody to wear, right? Um, but it goes back to Mature Mutts. Well, now they're short sleeves. It's hot. <laughs> So, um, Mark, excuse me, when, when yeah. is the meeting um, for Mitchell? It's this Saturday at 11. Right here? Yes. And I'll send out another reminder to all volunteers probably tomorrow. Um, one other thing I just wanted to quickly talk about was I'm putting on a teacher appreciation night here at PAC on May 2nd. Um, and people are like, why are you doing that? Well, because um, we do have a humane education program where we do go out to schools, like the Ampli Junior High Schools. Um, and we want to invite teachers to come here to learn about our programs, but also how they can partner with us in different ways, whether their kids make things in the school or they do community service projects for pets, teaching them that aspect of giving back, um, as well as showing them um, some curriculum that we've also created that they can take back to the classroom and do it themselves if they don't want a speaker to come. Um, and so if you guys are teachers or no teachers, please uh, tell them about it. So it's May 2nd, it's a Thursday, and it's from 4.30 to 6.30, and it's in this room. Um, and you guys are welcome to come by too if you want to say hello. There will be snacks and stuff, and the teachers will also get some private tours. Um, but I am looking for a few volunteers to help me out with that. I think there's a few signed up, um, but I will be having some little tables around with just some information about the different things that teachers can get involved in with as far as PAC goes. Um, and one last thing, um, or two last things, sorry. We're having an outreach info session tomorrow night in this room from 5 to 6, which is basically me talking about how we need you to help us <laughs> with um, outreach efforts as far as, you know, the Pup and Boots program, education, groups, tours, um, uh, fill the pantry, all those fun things that we're starting to do. And then the last thing is, is that we're going to start having volunteers help out in admissions. Um, we had some volunteers that are learning how to do microchips and stuff to help with um, um, some of the microchip events that we're going to have. So if anybody is interested in doing microchips, just let me know and we'll get you trained in admissions. But they quickly learned that it was super cool back there, and it was very interesting, and it's another great way to see how the shelter runs and what they do back there. So if you're interested in helping out, um, let me know, but I'm also going to send out some information with dates and times and all that. So um, that's it. Thank you. Okay, before you move on, sorry, I forgot something that was kind of important, and my apologies. So, um, I just I wanted to take a second and introduce Mary. Um, she's one of our volunteers. She's actually a newer volunteer, and she has been helping um, me do all kinds of things to really start making a lot of improvements and catching up on a lot of record keeping stuff and things that we haven't been able to do. And um, she's really been fantastic. She's hit the ground running. She's already at a point with logistics where she's taking on stuff and doing it herself. I don't have to sit and, and do that with her, which really helps me to be able to do more of the things that I'm supposed to be doing. So I just wanted, I, and I apologize because I did tell her I was going to introduce her and make her stand up. Um, so, <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, if you see her in there, you're welcome to ask her questions. And if she can't help you, she will certainly get the answers for you um, from me. So thank you so much. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to say thank you. We are looking into figuring out how to get administrative volunteers access to email. So if you do get an email that says it's from Mary, that's who it is. It's not some random person that said to impersonate a volunteer coordinator. Um, so I was spent last week at a conference in New Orleans, and I just have to say, hearing everybody else talk about like their struggles and what goes on at their shelter, really made I mean, not that I didn't appreciate you already, but it made me. I really appreciate you, and I'm very thankful for everything y'all do. You put a lot into pack, and we definitely couldn't do everything we do without y'all. So, thank you. Um, there is a meeting about the STR process um, in coming up. I think it's May 8th at 5:30. Sarah is going to send out an email to everybody on the at-risk email. Um, 
we sent out an email yesterday telling people to email Justin if they wanted to get on. Sorry about the, you were inundated with people asking to get on the Atlas. <laughs> but if you were interested in coming to the STR meeting, sign up for that and you'll get more information about it through the Atlas camp. For those of you who don't know, STR is um, short-term rescue, some animals that have been given a deadline for euthanasia. At the meeting, we're going to be talking about what this, what goes into that decision, um, and Sarah's going to be running it. She's looking for input on how y'all think the flow should work. So if a dog gets put on the urgent list and is being possibly considered for STR or has been put on STR, what should happen there to make sure that we are getting that dog all the chances we can? Um, so it's a pretty important meeting. Um, May the 5:30 is the tentative date, but Sarah will be sending out a, a more concrete invitation through the Atlas email. Um, I know we've been getting a lot of questions about STR lately. People feel like more animals are being put on STR and they don't understand why. When we're looking at the volume of animals, the, the number of animals who are being euthanized is down significantly. But we are communicating more openly about those animals. Um, in the past, we had a list of non-negotiable and if an animal came in with one of those non-negotiables, it would get euthanized before y'all had a chance to get to know it. So sometimes we have animals that, that have a history, or they have a history plus they're developing some concerning behavior in the shelter, and y'all already have met them. So it's not that we are putting more animals on STR. I know they come in in waves, um, and it feels like it's overwhelming, but it is just the way we're communicating it and the way we're making those decisions because we no longer have that list of if they do this, 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 and this, or or this, they automatically get euthanized. It allows us a lot more flexibility um, and lets us make judgment calls. Like, um, somebody told me about it. it used to be if they killed another animal. So an uh, animal kills a calf, like a six-month-old puppy killed a calf, and it would have to be euthanized because we had those emotions. So, do you all have any questions about that? Or what do you think, other than the process for deciding when an animal goes on STR and the flow of what happens after it's put on STR, is there anything else you think we should be discussing at that meeting? Yes. It was hard to hear you from back here, but so, will, we, will volunteers be able to have a list of suggestions? Seeing it from the other side. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, the staff is seeing it from one side, and probably from, from multiple sides, the volunteers are seeing it probably from just from one side. Right. But we do see things from a different point of view because unfortunately, fortunately, unfortunately, many of us get very attached to these dogs, and mostly it's dogs. Right. We get very attached to these dogs to the point that this becomes very stressful. So if we come up with some ideas, would, would staff consider our ideas as valid to think about? Are you talking about ideas for why we should designate an animal STR or what happens after they're designated? Ways to give us a heads up before they get to STR so we could work with them. Okay. I mean, um, K9 Fun Camp and Top Dog has had some really good results with some of these bigger dogs, bully dogs, dogs right. that, have, that are close to urgent. Right. And we've had some really good results with the intense training. Right. If we could get these dogs even before they become urgent, when we have more time to work with them, mm -hmm. we might be able to turn these dogs around. Yeah. So that's yeah. part of it. Yeah, we definitely want input on how to prevent these dogs from going STR in the first place. And if they have gone STR, how to help get them out of the shelter. Mm -hmm. The goal is to come away with it with some sort of flow chart that says a dog's designated as urgent or at risk, what happens like what are the different steps if it's designated as an STR? What are the different steps there? So we definitely want to put on that. Um, y'all are y'all do a lot of it, and we don't want to make it seem like it's all on, on y'all to get STR dogs out. We know sometimes people do feel that way, um, but you're going to be experts on what you think you can do to to help get those dogs out. And you're going to have good perspective on what we can do. So yeah, we definitely want that type of thing. Okay. Thanks. Is there any other type of questions you want to answer at that meeting if you're coming? Definitely just let me know or let Sarah know um, and we'll see what we can do about that. So, yeah, we ran over on a lot of this stuff, which is good because it meant y'all had a lot of questions from Mitzi and Scrappy. Um, 
Do you have any other just questions in general? Kim, you put your hand up. I just I thought maybe in the STR meetings it might be helpful to to know um, what criteria would help get a dog an extension. Okay. Like for some people who maybe don't work with them enough, like what would we need to present to say, okay, can we get this dog an extension? Like what types of things, you know, is that a committed rescue? Is that training? Like what types of things might allow a dog to get an extension? Okay. Uh, I will make sure we cover that because I, I don't know the answer. So. Do you have any other questions about that and things in general? No? Um, one thing I know people have asked questions about is the food, um, because we did change it again after changing it. Uh, mm -hmm. Michelle Figueroa and Dr. Wilcox are running a report to basically, like they're creating a report to figure out when increased instances of diarrhea have happened in relation to the food change to see if it is something that's normal or persisting, and we're just going to be looking into that really detail. Um, but that food is the best quality food that Dr. Wilcox remembers us feeding. Um, it is very rich, so when dogs come in, the first few days they may have diarrhea because one, they're stressed, and two, maybe they had, you know, old boy, and now they have this super rich food, it's going to make them sick. But if y'all do see super concerning stuff, let us know. Any other questions? Oh, I would like to say thank you very much. Uh, I believe that somebody was here fixing that um, rainy section, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I saw them doing trenches and stuff. So I appreciate that so much because that's a that's a mosquito gathering case. So I, 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 if you could pass along. I my thanks to whoever made that decision to okay. take care of that. We're definitely working with some of the drainage issues, like the lake outside of adoption. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I have one more thing just to add. I have to outdo Bonnie. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, the, it's about the awards, so volunteer rewards, sorry, that you guys get for your hours. Um, I know there was a lot of um, questions about why it's a fiscal year and not a regular year um, and the reason why we I started as a fiscal year is because we run on a fiscal year and that's our budget um, so our budget to purchase things for volunteers as far as um, rewards go but I do understand how annoying it is to calculate that um, so we will actually change it back then to a regular running year that's a word. Um, <laughs> so um, I'm just not sure because I don't want you to lose your hours from January, or excuse me, from July of last year, um, counting now. So if you want to go ahead, I don't know how we're going to do that just yet, um, but you can <laughs> claim your hours. Uh, we can still count it as a regular calendar year, um, a running year. <laughs> um, but you guys get, oh, I don't know how we're going to do that. I spoke too soon. I just started thinking about it. Sorry. <laughs> so, <laughs> not rewind. so here's the thing. We're going to change it. But wait, how do we? Um, so we're going to change it. And we'll send you guys an email when we figure out, figure out the specifics. How's that? Yeah. But okay. don't forget to, to look at the list. It's in your volunteer. Um, oh, my God. Your volunteer. Folder? Manual. Manual. Oh. <laughs> and uh, it's also hanging in the volunteer room, and it's also in the Facebook page in the file section. Um, so you guys, you guys do get uh, rewards um, based on your hours, whether it's free shirts, hats, fanny packs, um, free night stays at Central Pet. Um, <laughs> Also taking dogs from pack to a loyal companion. So if you have a favorite dog, you can take them there to hang out and play and have some fun. And you can also give those, um, the loyal companion one, you can give that to an adopter as well if you have a favorite dog um, as an incentive maybe. I don't know. Um, but they're, we're glad that they've been working with us. So that didn't come out right, but that's what I wanted to say. <laughs> uh, Good Thank you, Bonnie. I like it. Kristen told me about this cool book. It's basically a, a textbook on dog bites. 
um, and what goes into them, what factors play into it, what we know about it. And the conclusion so far is basically that we know nothing about dog bites. <laughs> we don't know much about dog aggression, especially aggression in the shelter. So it's just interesting to, to read it and know, like have it codified in science that we don't know much about aggression in shelter and that it isn't always predictive of animal behavior. So if you are interested in it, this is what it's called, dog bites, multiple disciplinary perspective. But it's like a 60 book, so um, I know I'm not going to buy it. <laughs> Do you all have any other questions? Yes. Is there paperwork to fill out to redeem your volunteer hours? Gina, is there paperwork to fill out to redeem your volunteer hours? There's no paperwork, but you have to come to Bonnie or I so we can put a little check mark that you claimed your hours. That's pretty much it. And I know nothing about it, so don't come to me for those. <laughs> Wait, did you like good job? <laughs> Anything else? Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.